summer, and we are um, all about being sent out into the places and spaces that God has called us to. Um, as I said before, my name is Ben, and I have the honor of serving as a lead pastor. And today, um, we are in the book of Acts, and we're going to hop back into a place um, that is going to be, um, it's interesting, because Whenever we gather together, there's people all across the faith map, right? Some of you have been following Jesus for a long time. Uh, you have, this is one of, you know, hundreds if not thousands of times that you have been to church. And for some of us, um, we're brand new, rechecking this out, reinvestigating, whether it's your first time ever at a church place or, or it's the first time in a long time because perhaps you were handed a faith as a child and, you know, the rigors of life and the real world kind of, you know, stood up and then you perhaps walked away from it for a little bit. But there's people all over the map. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that when Jesus walked planet earth, there was this undeniable connection between um, what happened in what we would call the Old Testament and what happened in the New Testament. What happened in the Old Testament, what happened in the New Testament. And when Jesus stepped foot um, on planet earth, it wasn't necessarily to get rid of the Old Testament, but more so to show that the Old Testament was pointing to what was going to happen in and through Jesus. But the problem was, which is honestly still the problem today, is that the Old Testament way of doing things was incredibly difficult to shed. The Old Testament way of, of, of acting and interacting with God was very difficult to let go of. And so today we're going to learn about somebody by the name of Stephen. Stephen was the first person to be killed um, for their faith, which we're actually going to read about today. And in it, Stephen gives this, this kind of survey of the Old Testament. But the reason he's given his survey of the Old Testament was for a purpose, which if you don't know the purpose, um, it kind of makes it seem like, okay, he's just giving a history lesson. But the summary of his survey is to say this, that there was a specific or two specific problems that happened in the Old Testament way of life. Namely, that religion was about a place and a practice. A place and a practice. There was a place that you went to worship, and there was a practice or a way that you lived your life. And the place that you went to and the practice that you had determined your acceptability to God. What's funny is Jesus steps foot on the scene to change and to shift that, to say it was never about a place, it was never about a practice, it was always about the coming person of Jesus. And the reason I start off with that is because if I was to say there was one thing that defines Southern Christianity. There's one thing that defines the cultural sense of Southern Christianity. It's that Christianity is about a place and a practice. Not intentionally, but oftentimes implicitly to the dismissal of the person of Jesus. So I don't know the house that you grew up in, but um, we, we went back and forth with our church attendance. But we, when we did attend church, I mean, you, you had to look sharp. Right? Some of you, you were, you were that. And it's, this is why I think kids don't like church. Right? Like, my kids don't wear things with buttons right now. Like, you, you try to get roads in, a, in, in pants with buttons. I'm like, dude, we're just going, like, we're going sweats all day. That's that. You're going to live until you're, like, high school in sweatpants. Right? Or, like, a little, like, you know, like, like slick shorts, like, ch -ch 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 -ch, right? <clears throat> he just, he just, it's, a, it's got elastic band he's in. If it doesn't, like, nope, it's just not happening. So we're just like, all right, dude, elastic bands from here on out until you grow up a little bit, right? But, but you're, you're told that this is how you're supposed to look. And I remember having a conversation with a friend one time, and I was talking to him. I was like, man, why do we get dressed up for church? He's like, dude. Yeah, he, like, I was irreverent. He's like, dude, we're going to the house of God. <laughs> I was like, sorry for asking, you know? <laughs> Sheesh, I didn't realize I was, like, I knew I was sinful, but not that sinful, sheesh, <clears throat> right? But, but depending on your church background, it, it's this place, and, 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 and to some degree, reasonably so, because it's a place where we do come and we worship God. But it's a place that the problem is, is it gives derivative implications of what we think about God, that God is this God that we can't approach, that God is this God who's untouchable, God is this God who's untraceable, God is this God who we have to stand and be silent the whole time. I remember one time I, I clapped in our old Episcopal church. Boy, I was a sinner, right? I'm talking about backsliding, right? Like, like I remember I started to do that, and my aunt looked over at me, and I'm like, I didn't know I could re be removed from, like, the family will that quickly, right? Like, and some of you, you grew up in churches like that, like I did, um, and, and in kind of just environments, and honestly, it probably wasn't the church. It just was the implicit culture of the church. But, but it gives this sense that this is the place, this is the place 
where you come. This is the place where you worship. This is the spot where God moves, and this is the place where you commune with God. And the problem with that is that in and of itself, it's not accurate theologically, but the real problem is that then creates a distance between God and the rest of our life. So we have to smash what's called the sacred-secular divide as if there's anything that's not sacred. That God has called us as sacred people into a world that wherever we are, we are the people of God in whom the Spirit of God dwells. But as long as it's about this place, right, the, the difficult part is, is, is we view everything else that happens in life as not about this place. And the other big thing was practice. And you know that you have fallen into the, um, at least the culture of practice of religion. If you have ever, if you have ever prayed and someone got onto you because your eyes weren't closed. Anybody else? Anybody ever had that? It's like, dude, why are you peeking? I'm like, I didn't know. God's like, yeah, you're peeking. I'm not going to listen to that prayer. I missed that one in the Psalms, right? Or you, you have your hat on, and I make fun of this all the time. It's like, you know, you got this hat, and you're praying, and, you know, it's, you know everybody bow your head, you know, fellas, hats, you know. God's like, man, I'm so glad you said hats. and Because for a while, I thought I was the ultimate infinite God, and then you had that hat on, and I was like, I can't hear what he's thinking. If only he would think it louder, you know, then I would finally be able to hear. And those are kind of simple, you know, easy ways. But let's be honest. <clears throat> most of us, most of us determine our acceptability to God. If we're just being honest. Most of us determine our acceptability to God based on how often we show up to a place and how well we do our practice. Isn't that true? You see, we, we would read in the second what we're going to read, we would think, man, I'd never identify with that. I would never identify with that. In fact, here's what happens in Acts chapter, we're going to, the end of chapter 6, when Stephen is arrested, this, these were the accusations that they lobbied against him. Uh, starting at verse 13. They set up false witnesses who said, and this is the kind of the Jewish council, who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. In other words, this temple, this holy place and the law, the practice of religion that God has given us. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. We've heard that he said he's going he's to get rid of this temple and he's going to change the customs. Not realizing the entire time that the place and the customs were supposed to be things that would drive us to God. Not be the embodiment or totality of God. Here's what I mean by that. Let me kind of give you some of the end of the sermon now. That the temple would be the place that the presence of God dwelled, would be a foreshadowing that eventually through Jesus' death and resurrection, by the power of the Holy Spirit, our bodies would be the place that the presence of God dwelled, that we would be the temples. But that was to give us a picture of what that would be like someday. In the law, the practice would not be so that we could, that we could earn our way to God. It would be to prove to us that we can't earn our way to God. Because unless we have an objective law by which we understand that we have not performed, we will never really understand that we actually need a Savior. Because we'll always look to the subjectivity of each other's morality. And so we read this and we think, man, I don't think I've ever gotten mad at the, the temple and the law and, and all that. Yet we evaluate ourselves based on how they evaluated Stephen. So we're going to read a good amount of this. Stephen's going to give an overview of this Old Testament. And here's going to be the basic theme of it, just to give you a heads up. The theme of it is going to be this. It was never about a place. It was never about a practice that God was on a mission for redemption through a person. That God has always and will always be on a redemptive mission based on a person. So this is what Stephen responds, starting in, in 7, verse 1. So the high priest said, the high priest who was most likely, most likely Caiaphas, who was most likely the person who um, judged Jesus. The high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said, without answering the question this entire time, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred 
and go into the land that I will show you. And then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into the land in which you are now living. And here's what he was beginning to set up. That God spoke to Abraham, Father Abraham, who had many and many sons had. Very good. And so God spoke to Abraham before, actually, he was named Abraham, but when he was named Abram, and God said, okay, I want you to go, I want you to do something. In other words, God is beginning to to do something. God is beginning to work. God is beginning to move. God is beginning to speak. God is on his redemptive person before there was even a place. If it was predicated on a place, then the place would have existed, existed first. But we're putting the place ahead of the purpose. Verse 5, yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length. In other words, it didn't make a lot of sense, but promised to give it to, his, to, give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And so God said, okay, Abraham, I'm going to, I'm going to do all of this. I'm going to make you a people. I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to give you this land. It's going to be your inheritance, and then you're going to be a light with it. And Abraham stood up and said, well, we don't even have a kid. God's like, don't worry. I'm going to take care of that. Verse 6, and God spoke to this effect. That his offspring would be sojourners in the land. Not a place, they would be wanderers, travelers in the land. Belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. And so even though they're going to enslave you, there's still a plan and a purpose of God. He gave them the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. If you've never read the Bible, you need to read Genesis. You need to read all of this in Genesis. Because sometimes when we read this in the Bible, we read it through the lens of, man, these were, these were the, the legends, the heroes of faith. These, this was the most dysfunctional family on planet Earth. I'm telling you, like... like like you, if I was writing the Bible, if I was God, honestly, I would not have chosen this family, right? Like I would have chosen like a decent family, a family that lives in, you know, a nice place or space. Um, I want to go into all of it, but I just, I, I don't have time. But I just want to say this, you should read this for yourself because we begin to, again, heroicize these people and, and Abraham had problems. He messed up. There was multiple times where um, he would go to a place and they'd show up and they, he'd say, hey, this is not my wife. This is my sister. Don't kill me, please. And then after a while, they'd say, this is not your, just your sister. This is your wife. And he'd be like, oh, yeah. Thanks, God. I'm just telling you, read the Bible. That's all I'm saying. In the patriarchs, verse 9, jealous of Joseph. Joseph was, you know, one of the, the 12. Sold him into Egypt. Um, but God was with him. So his brothers, again, I don't know how dysfunctional your um, sibling uh, you know, dynamic is, but perhaps you haven't been sold into slavery. This guy did. And rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. So this was his thing. It started off bad, sold into slavery, but God was on a redemptive plan. Not about a place or a practice. Now, there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 uh, persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. Now, that's that's like... The amount of redemptive history that he's shoving into this like little compact thing, it's like, it's like drinking through a fire hydrant, okay? So there's a lot of story in this, but just simply to say that there was a crazy thing that happened. Joseph sold into slavery, went through some interesting things, had some interesting dreams, eventually ascended through a wild set of events to be over all of Egypt. His brothers didn't know it. His brothers thought he was dead. He ends up saying, nope, I'm alive. And all of a sudden, everybody comes, they worship him, and he's over a lot. But unfortunately, the leaders forget. Verse 17, but as time, as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. At which point the nation would have thought, perhaps the promise is dead. Perhaps what God said isn't true. 
Verse 19, he dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. This is the, the king. At this time, this was when Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. I love how he was beautiful before he was born. He's like, that's a really cute kid. I like you, Moses. It's not actually what it means, but my commentary. Anyways, and when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him, brought him, and set him as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. He was 40 years old. It came in his heart that, um, to visit his brothers. This is the people that he's living in Egypt with that were um, people of Israel, the children of Israel. Seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, in other words, Moses one day sees a couple people, they're fighting, they're both of the nation of Israel, um, and before he had just killed somebody for being too hard on one of his, you know, brothers, and then he sees them fighting. He says, you all, you know, chill out. He says, men, you're brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to, do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And at this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, as he's transitioning here, it was about, it was consistently about a person that, would to come, that was to come, a kingdom and a nation that God was going to be a light through. But there was multiple times in the process, there was multiple times in the process where it seemed like this purpose and this plan was dead. And what he's about to do is set up Moses as a pre-Jesus. And so he says, let me just tell you that God was going to, in fact, deliver the nation through this person, Moses. And so Moses goes and tries to, you know, help these two people. But the two people who saw Moses rejected Moses, even though Moses was the deliverer. Now, what they don't know is Stephen's about to say, and so did you, religious leaders. The same way they rejected Jesus, or the same way they rejected Moses, you have rejected the person that was the purpose of this place and practice. Now, 40 years passed, and an angel appeared to him in the wilderness, verse 30, Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire and bush. And when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight and knew that he, he drew near to look. And there came a voice of the Lord saying, I am the Lord, your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled, reasonably so, because I want you to imagine you're seeing a burning bush, and all of a sudden it starts talking. It's like, I'm God. Like, yeah, trembling. It's nine times out of ten. The Lord said to him, verse 33, take off your sandals from your feet. The place where you're standing is holy ground. In other words, you think that the temple was a holy ground? The place of the presence of God is the holy ground. It's about the, the presence of God, not the particular place. And if you and I are people who have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, we are consistently at a place where we are holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and they have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Verse 35, this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer, by the way, which would perfectly describe Jesus, By the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush, this man led them out of Egypt, performing wonders, signs in Egypt, and at the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise you up, a prophet like me, from your brothers. In other words, God, Moses said that there was going to be some of a prophet that was going to come. And this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us, a.k.a. Ten Commandments and the Law. In other words, you want to know where that law came from? It came from Moses. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside and set their hearts, or and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who we will go before us. 
and for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt. Now, this is what he's piecing together. And they would have understood this because they had an incredible depth. Or they might not have understood it at this point, but they, they were tracking with him. This isn't, you know, um, Stephen saying, hey, um, Jewish council, <laughs> I know that you have the entire Old Testament memorized, but let me give you a little refresher in case you forgot. Here was his point and his plan and his purpose. It was never about a place. It was always about the presence of God. It was never about a place. It was about the fact that God was on a purpose to redeem mankind through a person. And consistently along the way, it looked like it was done. Consistently along the way, it looked like the the plan of God perhaps had stopped. But it hadn't. Sometimes it it was from Egyptian slavery. Sometimes it was from Egypt itself. And sometimes, sometimes it was from the people of God themselves. At times, as God was moving and as God was working, and God would perform miracles, and the people of God would reject the person that God had sent to redeem and restore and deliver. And the rejection was to say, no, we want to serve something else than the thing that God has provided for us. Even though there were signs, even though there was miracles, even though there was deliverance, that the people would reject it in favor of something else because it's oftentimes, I think, just easier to worship a thing than it is to worship a person. But this person, whose name is Jesus, he's setting up and saying, Look, this person that you're so concerned about with Moses. You rejected him. You rejected him in the first place. You you didn't even live up to what he said, and now you're just so concerned that this whole thing is going to be torn down. Verse 40, when they made a calf in those days, and they offered sacrifices to the idols, and were rejoicing the works of their hands, but God turned away and gave them over to worship, to worship the, the hosts of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. He says, come on, let me just bring this, what Isaiah said in, by the way, because I know everybody loves Isaiah. He says, did you, did you bring me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? In other words, hey, hey, before there was a house, before there was a place, before there was a worship. Remember when we were in the desert? At any point in time, was it about your sacrifice? No, it was about God's provision. You took up the tent of Malak and the stars of your God, Raphon, and the images that you made to worship. And I will send you into ex- to exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of, of witnesses or of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it. They, it was a God of the tents. He roamed around. It wasn't one specific place. It was about the presence of God. Verse 45. Our fathers in turn brought it with Joshua when they, when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. And so it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the, for the God of Jacob. <laughs> but by the way, it wasn't even David who they would all revere as the greatest king. It was about Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High, he says, does not dwell in the house made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make all these things? So at this point, if you checked out, here's the point of all of that. He was building a cumulative argument to say, I understand. I understand why you think it's about this. But do not miss the purpose behind the practice. Do not miss the purpose behind the place. Because there's going to be a tendency to want to go to the place And there's going to be a tendency to want to go to simply the practice, the law. But he says, come on, when Moses gave you the law, you didn't listen to it. And when it was about a place, I mean, come on, God did so much before the place was even there. Here's what I think is interesting with that. We want to exist in a place where we show up again to worship And in terms of the law, if we were able to achieve goodness with God because of our behavior, essentially what this is saying 
is that it's, one, impossible, and two, we haven't even lived up to our own version and standard of that. Like, no matter where you get your sense of moral compass from, whether it's a biblical moral compass or whether it's you know, somewhere else, something else, what you've kind of pieced together, what your parents taught you, whatever it is, come on. None of us, none of us have done that, and that was never the point. Verse 51, and so you stiff-necked people, this is what really got them, you stiff-necked people, that was Old Testament language, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears. They're like, my ear? What? That doesn't even make sense. (laughs) My lobes, perhaps. Anyways, you stiff-necked people, (laughs) uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. He says, as your fathers did, and so do you. He says, come on, you have seen this, you have seen this, you have seen this, you've seen it happen over, that, that your fathers did this. He says this, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Now, this was, this was massively, massively accusatory, but at the same time, incredibly insightful. He says, come on, let's, let's not be ignorant of this. We have seen this before. We have seen a group of people who were all about a place and all about a practice, and they thought this was how God was going to work, and this is how God was going to move, and this is what God was going to do, and it was all about going to this place and observing this practice. And whenever anybody didn't fit, whenever anybody pushed back against it, whenever anybody said, no, 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 God wants to do something that's actually the, the enlightenment of what God initially and originally intended, but perhaps we just kind of misinterpreted, and they just got furious about it. So he says, we've seen it play out. Let's look at our fathers. Let's look at everybody before us. They all Every single prophet they rejected, every single prophet they killed. And by the way, they rejected everyone who talked about the Messiah. And you, by the way, have killed the Messiah himself. Now, we weren't there. We were not there as the people who were saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. But we have all turned and rejected Jesus in our own unique and individual ways. And that is accusatory. But it's also common for all of us. There is not a perfect person in this room. There is not a person who has done everything right. There is not a person who is sinless, who is blameless. There's not, probably not a person who hasn't done something wrong today. I'm not going to call out you who sped on the way here. <laughs> but right, the idea behind this The idea of of everything he's communicating is that God was on plan. God was on a purpose. God was going to redeem all of mankind through a person, that there was going to be a ruler and a redeemer. And what the writers of the New Testament would take this and they would expound on, and they would say, and the law and the prophets, and Jesus would say, and the law and the prophets, they would bear witness to it. They would all say, yes, it's going to happen. It's going to come. But please, in the, in the level of place and practice, do not miss the person. Because they were just supposed to be a setup for the redemption through Jesus. Well, this didn't make him happy. They said, you have now betrayed and murdered you who received the law as delivered by angels. You did not keep it. I love that. He's, he's, you had the background and the inheritance, and you still missed it. That might be the quintessential description of Southern Christianity. We have the background. Many of us, we have the history. Many of us, we were raised in the church. We were raised in the place. We put on the right clothes. We said the right manners. We took off our hat when we prayed. And we did all that and thought that that was what it was all about and missed Jesus in the whole process. And if you're enraged by that and that's offensive to you, that's, you're in good company. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. <laughs> you see what I did there? <laughs> and ground their teeth at him. So don't do that, please. That's, Dennis is going to have a problem. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God standing. The glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So he gazes into heaven. He sees God. He's full of the Spirit. And he said, behold, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. They, then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. 
They threw rocks at him till he died is what that means. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, who we're going to read about in the next week. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Jesus, Lord, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. This was the message. This was the message that flipped the early church, the early world on its head. This was the message that not too long before this, in front of this same priest, the same high priest, all of the disciples would flee. All of the disciples would deny. Every single one of them. But when they saw a resurrected Jesus, when they saw that this teacher, this prophet, this miracle worker that they had high hopes for, but they saw die and said, nope, he ain't it. When they saw him come back from the dead, they all of a sudden came to the awareness, and then the Holy Spirit comes down, it fuels them, and they are sent. And their basic message is this. It is about the redemptive work of a person. And that God has been on a passionate purpose to redeem his people. He has been on a passionate purpose that it's not about just this holy place that you and I are in fact as bearers of the Holy Spirit, the holy place of God, the holy places of God. And so the people of God are moving in the spirit of God out into the world, into the mission field that God has given us. Because God has now granted us the gift in the ministry of reconciliation. That God was doing something and God is doing something. That God, when God died and then God rose from the dead, they realized this is about a person. This was never about a practice. This was never about a place. But the person of Jesus who redeemed all mankind. The person of Jesus who was never about show up and behave. The person of Jesus who said, because of the fact that even your most fervent efforts to show up and behave, you are still find yourselves sinful, as we all will. But perhaps you'll find that that was kind of the point. That we don't live for God I say this all the time. We don't live for God to make God happy with us because we can't. We live for God because of Jesus' death, which covers us, forgives us, pays the payment for God. Because of our sinfulness, there is a discrepancy. There is a gap, a chasm between us and God, which we can't in our behavior apologize enough for. And we were never supposed to. And Jesus did that for us. So we don't live for God to make God happy with us. We live for God because God is happy with us. We don't live for him in hopes that, man, maybe if I'm good enough, my father will be happy with me. If if I'm good enough, maybe he will be my father. He says, no, I am your father. And so we live to honor and glorify him. Here's the message this morning. Here's what I want you to take and do with this. At times... This is so easy to get away from. And for some of you, you've been around a church for a long time. So had they. The rhythm of a church, the rhythm of a religious institution, is to say it's about a place and a practice to the dismissal of the person. But God is on a redemptive mission through the person of Jesus. And so today, this is simply just an anchor for us to spend time remembering Jesus, to spend time remembering that this entire thing is all about him, that this entire thing is all about God, this entire thing is all about what God has done for us. And so with that being said, we thought, man, the best way that we can possibly end today is to remember what God actually did for us, which was to die. For each and every one of us. That person is the anchor. That resurrection was the substantiation that he, in fact, was the embodiment of the plan and purpose of God all along. And let's not miss that with all the religious place and practice. That now God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. To do what Stephen did which is to tell a lost and a hurting and a broken world that God has done something. God has died for each and every one of us. 
So we're going to end our service today by singing a song and taking communion together. Jesus, right before he died, got his, his disciples together. And he said, as he took a piece of bread, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He got the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. This is, this is a sign of the new covenant, the new relationship. Not you trying to earn, but you simply receiving grace. Unmerited favor. And so, in a second, the band's going to come back up. Actually, band, y'all can come back up. Thanks, guys. Um, I don't love doing communion this way, but it just makes the most sense because of COVID. Um, But under your seat, you've got a um, little cup on the little thingy. Uh, We call these, well, I'm not going to tell you what we call them. Um, (laughs) We call them swear and tears just because, like, we don't like them. Um, We like to, you know, have the bread and take it as a family, as a a community and a group of people. Um, But what I want you to do is, is, is during this next song, I just want you to be in thought. I want you to be in prayer. And as you feel like your heart is at the point where you're saying, okay, yes, Jesus, this is all about you. Everything in my life is all about you. You are the centerpiece of this whole thing. You are the centerpiece of my existence and of my world. And God, I will never be good enough, but I will always be good enough because of you, because of this sacrifice that was made for me. If you have fallen into the rhythm and the pattern of a place and a practice, this is a time of repentance. To us to turn and say, no, I want to be more consumed with being in love with Jesus than avoiding the sin in my life. I want to be more consumed with being in love with Jesus than simply showing up to church or to group. I want to be in love with the God who so loved me he gave his only begotten son to die. So in this next song, I just want to invite you to a place. And perhaps for you, today is the first time that you're actually, that's sinking in and you're believing that, you're knowing that, and you know that that's true. And today is your day to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, the, the Redeemer and the Ruler that he already is, by the way. But it's your acceptance of that. And so I think if that's you and you're in this room and you're thinking, man, I, that is me. I've rejected him and I don't want to be the person who misses it. And you simply pray and say, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. I want to be about you, the person of Jesus, the death and the sacrifice you made for me. So be my Lord, be my Savior. Perhaps this is your first communion as a believer in Jesus. And if you're not, man, we would just, we would say, by all means, feel feel no sense that you should do this. This would be like us saying, hey, if you don't know Jesus, come get baptized. It's a sign of the covenant. And so for those of you who are kind of waffling and not really sure where you are, then I would just say, I mean, we love you. We're so glad that you're here. But this is a time of people to say, the sacrifice that you have made for me, I'm taking, I'm receiving, I'm believing, and now I'm living for you, King Jesus, my ruler and my redeemer. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you that you were always on a plan, always had a purpose, And it was always about a person, a redeemer and a ruler whose name was Jesus. That the promise of Abraham was the promise of you, Jesus. That the promise of Joseph was the promise of you, Jesus. That the person of Moses was a setup for the person of Jesus. That the ruler of David was a ruler of David who would come into the line and would deliver through that line the king whose name is Jesus. And Solomon would build the temple, the temple which would typify, which would typify the person of Jesus in whom the fullness of God would please to, was pleased to dwell. And as Jesus died, rose again, the Holy Spirit came down. We are now the temple, the temples of your spirit. That all of this was simply a setup, it was never about a place, was never about a practice, was always about a person. And please help us to see that and to fall more in love with you, the person of Jesus, than we are concerned about the places and the practices with which we engage. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.